just going to speak uh, for a few minutes about finding a mentor and getting strong letters of recommendation. And this is something that I'm sure is maybe on your mind now or, or will be down the road. To get started, I wanted to kind of just tell a quick story. This is going to be my story. That's me, animated. Uh, I started just very briefly. I did my undergrad at UCLA. I went to UCSF for medical school. And then I went to Boston Children's for residency. And it was kind of this step between UCSF and Boston Children's that I'm going to kind of focus on. But I just wanted to show you a couple more things in terms of where I went after that, um, because the context I think will, will matter. After Children's, I went to do my fellowship at CHLA in infectious diseases. I worked at the CDC for a couple of years, went to Khan Academy and worked at Stanford for about 10 years doing PEDS ID. And at Khan Academy, I was doing most medical education videos, and that got me to osmosis. So a lot of people kind of wonder about you know, how'd you go from a medical education path to something that was very different. And that was the key step there is kind of leaving the CDC and public health and going into medical education. So that's my story, but I wanted to kind of digress now and tell you a little bit about my parents. So this is um, uh, not my mom and dad, but this is uh, supposed to kind of uh, show you representation of my parents. And their version of marriage when they were growing up was something like this. This isn't necessarily um, all marriages of their cohort, but certainly how my mom and dad got married was uh, an arranged marriage. They met each other and got married all within about seven to 10 days. So it was a pretty quick uh, event, right? They met each other for the first time. And it was very much what, what they call now when we talk about it, kind of a checkbox marriage. And in India, even today, in my family, we call this marriage. It, you don't call it a checkbox marriage, it's called the marriage. But the checkboxes were things like, you know, what, what is she bringing to the table? What is he bringing to the table? Um, and I have kind of farm animals here, and that's not too far from the truth, to be honest, in terms of how my parents met. So it was kind of like, what, what can they bring to this union uh, so that we can start out uh, financially on, on strong footing? And so it was very transactional. It was very much, you know, what... What do you have expectations for? What are, what, what are my expectations? Can we kind of sign to some agreement? And this is really how they saw it. They saw it as a very transactional thing. And their marriage has evolved over the years. But this is certainly how it started. Now, when I was growing up, the story of marriage that I always heard was a different story. It was kind of shapes through media. I grew up in the U.S. Uh, for the most part, I was born in London, but then moved to the U.S. So it was a very different sort of story I was told. It was this story. It was what we would call love marriage. And in fact, in India today, in my family, uh, we still call this a love marriage. And the other marriage I described would just be marriage. So that's kind of the default. And this is kind of the special love marriage. In fact, even when I talk to my parents now about cousins, you know, they'll say, oh, so-and-so got married. It was a love marriage. They'll go out of their way to kind of imply that it was not just a marriage. It was, there was love involved. And the reason that I mention this is that this is more about the relationship, right? This is uh, a lot less about transactional and more about kind of who you are as a person, who the other person is as a person, and does that mesh well? And, and how is the relationship going to kind of fit together? And, and I've kind of thrown in a bunch of icons of hearts, and certainly people bring their dogs and cats to a, to a marriage, but it's a lot less transactional, right? It's much more about that relationship and cult, kind of cultivating that relationship. So the reason I bring this analogy up is that I think it really relates back to the topic today of mentorship. So, you know, when I think about mentorship, and certainly back when I was kind of going from UCSF to Boston Children's and trying to navigate that road, trying to figure out what to do, right here, I was thinking about, you know, letters of recommendation, how I would go about getting letters of recommendation. And I, I typically work backwards. I said, well, okay, how many letters do I need? Uh, and you go on the ERAS website, and even today, you know, it says, oh, you need four letters. And kind of gives you vague tips on what you should do. And you know, you'll get something like this, you know, don't get it from a family member. Well, of course, you know, you probably wouldn't think about doing that. And don't get, letter, or get letters from the specialty you want to pursue and get them from an institution you want to go to and waive the right to see it and give the letter writer plenty of notice. And this is, I think, still how a lot of med students view letters of recommendation. They view it as a list of checkboxes. Not unlike how my parents and that whole generation viewed marriage. They saw it as a transactional thing. Like, let's just go and get the letters and be done with it and try to get them as strong as possible. And when you think of it this way, really, like, what are you getting out of the relationship? What are you getting a letter? And what is your letter writer getting out of the relationship? Kind of a big shrug, right? Like, I don't know. I don't know what they get out of writing the letter for you. Maybe they get satisfaction of having written another letter, but that's not that satisfying. So... 
it's unclear even what that transaction even comes down to. But typically, people feel a little awkward about asking. It always seems like an uncomfortable conversation. Um, sometimes people will ask and follow up with an email. It, it, it always feels like kind of this walking on eggshells thing because it is so transactional. And what I want to get you to start thinking about, and this is something that's shaped my entire life, is not thinking about it as a checkbox relationship. Just like today, a lot of us would think about that checkbox marriage as being so far from kind of how you view marriage um, or, or any civil union or any partnership. I want you to get away from the idea of viewing this relationship as, as just another checkbox relationship or transaction to something that's much more like a real relationship. So to do that, I think it's important to start getting vulnerable and identifying where you need help. And I put down a list of things that I actually needed help with at different stages of my own career. And I'm just going to kind of read through this list. And one thing I think would be very helpful for everyone here to do is start kind of cataloging as you go through your medical career, what are the areas where you need help? And I mean both professional help or maybe personal help, but kind of cataloging that for yourself. So for myself, you know, things like figuring out how to balance school with my personal life, specifically eating healthier and going to the gym, uh, thinking about careers outside of clinical work and research. You know, when I was at UCSF, all I knew was clinicians and researchers. I didn't even know what a doctor could do outside of those two fields. I never had met anyone. Communicating more effectively with patients, but also with colleagues. And I never really presented, you know, earlier, Vicky was talking about a poster. She's like, I know it's more than just a poster, but what is it? That's the question I would have for you. Like, have you gone to a poster session? Have you ever had to create a poster, stand in front of it, and then defend your arguments in the poster and have people ask you questions and try to answer them to the best of your ability? It really requires a lot of communication skills. And so that's something I definitely needed a lot of help with. Uh, learning how to use data analytics tools, you know, like SAS. That's something I learned when I was at the CDC. I needed a ton of help with that. And even understanding what tools are out there you know, for data analysis, increasingly important. Um, deciding which specialty to pursue. For me, it was pediatrics versus internal med. But I'm sure each of you, as you go through this and kind of figure out what you want to do, has struggled with, you know, what, what do I really see myself doing? And that's something you might need help with. Staying in touch with interests outside of medicine. For me, that was a big deal. When I came out of college, I had a whole bunch of interests, specifically things like playing badminton. You know, something that I just didn't have time for when I was in medical school. Nobody played. There were no courts available, things like that. Uh, and then budgeting my time effectively and not feeling overwhelmed. And actually, I didn't write this down, but budgeting also triggers budgeting money effectively. I mean, school has a ton of debt. And a lot of times, that's an important driver. I mean, certainly a driver in terms of how you spend your time. Are you getting paid for it? Uh, are you able to spend or, or kind of within your means? All that kind of stuff matters a lot. And so getting help figuring that stuff out. And knowing how to do that. Are there even tools to do that? So these are the areas where I needed help at different stages of my life. Many of them I still need help with, especially the second bullet point. And so I really want you to start by cataloging this. You know, the, the, the step to kind of growing a relationship with a mentor beyond just a set of checkboxes is to figure out what you need. And you can't do that without being honest with yourself. So that's kind of the first thing. The next thing is to say, okay, now that you know what you need, how are you going to go out and get it? Now, one of the big things that I see is people say, well, I know that there's that one person I have my eye on who I think would be a really great person to kind of get to know better, maybe be a mentor for me, but I'm not sure how to approach them. I mean, what do I say? Hi, I'd like to be your mentee, you know, or hi, can you be my mentor? That feels so awkward. It feels very stilted. And so again, just like any other relationship that you might pursue, maybe someone that's out there that's caught your eye in, in a personal way. You know, how would you get that person to take notice of you? Well, you'd probably show some hustle. You know, you might go out of your way. You know, for myself, I'll tell you a quick story. There was a person at the CDC who I thought would be a great mentor for me. He was really busy. And I found out one time he was leading a run, uh, a physical run. And I'm not one to go out and run, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to go and do this run. I'm going to run with him the whole run. And I'm going to be shoulder to shoulder with this guy. And I'm going to talk to him the whole way because he has to be there. And I'm going to be there. I'm going to just get noticed. And so I did that. So do those little things that show some hustle. Um, stand out. You know, anyone can send a card afterwards. Send a card that's got something that's kind of funny, or maybe that, that's got some sort of um, meme that they might relate to. You know, we've got these spread joy cards, so many of them. 
and they're all sciencey in some way or medically in some way, do something that's a little different, like send one of these cards rather than a standard like thank you card you might get from Hallmark. Stay engaged. That's one of the big things. Once you have that first interaction with a mentor, how do you kind of stay on their radar without being annoying? Well, one great way is just to say, hey, you know what? I just came across this thing. I thought you'd be interested because I know it's in your area of research. So little things like that you could do. And then this is really important, but follow up. You know, a lot of times a letter writer will kind of be willing to write a letter for you, but then afterwards they never hear from you. They don't know kind of what, what became of you. And so follow up and say, you know what? Thank you so much for writing a letter. This is what I ended up doing. Because the truth is a mentor, again, it's a relationship. It's not just that one transaction you're gonna you know, engage in at the end of you know, second year or third year or fourth year, but it's gonna be someone that you're gonna come back to time and time again. My mentors I've had for now 10, 15 years. And so definitely follow up, just let them know every six months what you're up to and what, what challenges you're facing. Um, be thoughtful, you know, do something nice for your mentor. So for example, you can send them a LinkedIn recommendation. You can, if you're gonna go meet them, I put a little, um, uh, ask, uh, image of a, of a burrito, grab some lunch, say like, hey, I got lunch, I thought you might want to join me as we're going to have our lunch meeting today. Um, little things like that really make a difference. Um, being responsive, you know, saying like, hey, you know, I, I know that we're supposed to meet up in mid-October, and so don't forget that. And, you know, one tool I always use is called Boomerang. And that, you know, when mid-October hits, it kind of automatically reminds you like, oh, you had this meeting. So a mentor will kind of notice that, like, oh, we said mid-October, mid-October hit, and I got that email from, from Vicky. And, and that means that Vicky is obviously kind of the kind of person that cares and takes note of things like that. Uh, and finally, learn about their interests. You know, like anyone that you're trying to get to know better, have a relationship with, get to know their interests, understand kind of what makes them tick. And that's going to kind of go a long distance in, sort of, in terms of making them think that you're the kind of person they want to invest their time into. Again, just the more you view it as a relationship, the more you're going to start naturally to do these things that you would do with any other important relationship in your life. And I can't tell you how important that mentor or mentee relationship has been. The more people I talk to, almost everyone can point to that one person, those two people that really push them over the line. For me, I just want to kind of point out and flag out, these are the two characters that have made a huge difference. On the left, Roger Glass. On the right, Umesh Prasher. I wouldn't be here in any way, shape, or form if it weren't for these two people. And so these are people I continue to kind of reach out to, give updates to, and in any way if I can help them out, I, I try to do that. Um, so here's some discussion questions. I thought it'd be awesome to at least get you thinking about what is something that you think a mentor could help you with specifically? So it could be a few things if you have a list like I do, or it could just be that one big thing that you really think a mentor could help you out with at this point in, in your life. What are some qualities that you would look for in a mentor? It's kind of the flip side of it. So what are some things that you're naturally kind of attracted to in a mentor? Someone that has, let's say, great charisma, uh, or it could be someone that has an incredible research portfolio, or someone that does great work in advocacy and you want to learn more about that. So whatever that is, you know, that would be something that would be worth at least documenting because then when you're looking for a mentor, you think, okay, did they at least hit the things that I said I was looking for? and not just kind of a checkbox that I need to, to cross off. Um, and then finally, imagine that you found a mentor. What are some ways that you would actually try to help form a relationship with that person? For me, again, I didn't have good mentors. Those two people I showed you, that was at the CDC. That was a full eight years after I left med school. So I wish I had gotten mentorship or stronger mentorship earlier in life. I had a lot of people that in name were mentors, like, oh, my big buddy or my big brother or whatever. Uh, they give you kind of names when I go to med school, of people you should partner up with, but they weren't real mentors. They weren't really people that would kind of go up to bat for you or felt like I had a strong relationship with. So, you know, when you found that mentor, what are ways that you'd really grab onto that person to really kind of forge that relationship if you think it's worth doing?